So, this is the time we move into the sermon. Uh, this is the time where we hear from God through His Word. And the theme today is going to be built around tearing down and breaking up, or tearing down and building up, excuse me. Uh, there's a term that you may or may not be familiar with called gentrification. And gentrification is all around us. We see it in South End, Wilmore, Belmont, Plaza, Midwood, and especially here in NODOT. And what's happening is there are, there's an older neighborhood that's existing. And as people are moving to Charlotte for, for jobs and just for the four seasons, even though it feels like we've had winter for a really long time this year, <clears throat> as people are moving here, they're desiring to live close to the center part of the city. And so a lot of these old houses are being either renovated or completely demolished and being built up. So the first example of this is some houses are partially torn down. There's going to be a picture on the screen behind me of what this looks like. They're partially torn down and they're renovated. Um, the first picture, please. So this is kind of a before and after. Uh, there's, a, there's an older looking house. And what they've done is they've gone through and they put a new door. Uh, they've really made the outside look kind of modern. And if there's pictures of the inside, it would probably look even more amazing. So that's one example of gentrification. And the second is this, is that some houses are completely torn down and a new one is built. So you can see the example in this picture. There was an older home and right next to it was probably a house that looked just like it. They've torn it down and built a whole new house. And I believe this is the theme that we're going to uncover today. When we think about 2 Corinthians 5.17, Scripture says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In modern day Christianity, a lot of Christians think it's more of like that first picture. We're just going to get a makeover. It's going to be a better you. There's all these New Year resolutions. New Year, new me, or better me, or whatever it is. And Christianity is actually not just painting the outside and making it look better or giving the inside some changes. It's actually God coming through and completely removing the old you and making a brand new you. Okay? So if you guys would please stand with me. We're going to read together Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 50. I'll read aloud if you'll read in your hearts. The words will be on the screen. Verse 30. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to, be, going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid of him. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter a life crippled than two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. 
For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray briefly. Father, thank you again for this time. Thank you for your word. I pray that you would give us power to hear and give me power to speak. Your power, not ours. I pray that you would take what is said and done and you would cement it in our hearts that we might be disciples who go forth from this place declaring the good news of Jesus to every man, woman, and child we come into contact with. Holy Spirit, we need your help now, so we pray and beseech you for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So I want to ask you a question. You don't have to answer out loud, but I want to ask you this question. Who would like God's grace? Who wants God's grace? Okay. Everybody. Everybody wants the grace of God. So the second question is, do you know who is the biggest hindrance to you receiving the grace of God? Us. Us? Collectively? Personally. You. You are the biggest hindrance to you receiving the grace of God. And so the title of the sermon is The Disciples' Deconstruction. And what you see Jesus doing in this passage, He's breaking down the things they thought, the places they walked, and the things that they did. And He does this simply by exposing to us our pride. Okay? Okay? Um, I'm, I'm super convinced in the past few weeks, I have seen the evil one. I have seen some great disruption come against myself, my family, and our church. And I'm convinced that Satan wants to use our pride as the conduit to take our eyes off of Jesus, to take our eyes off of the grace of God, to forget our position in the kingdom and start to distract us. And start to make us center our thoughts, attentions, and affections on everything, on other things other than Christ. And so, a couple of y'all heard me use this analogy, but if if we're if we're on a cliff and we're the victorious ones, we push Satan off the cliff, and as he's falling down, he pulls out his squirt gun and he tries to squirt us with water on the way down. <laughs> he's desperate. He's desperate. Because Scripture says that God is victorious, that the gates of hell will not prevail against His church, His bride. We who have trusted and put our faith in Jesus Christ are the ones who are His bride, and therefore we are victorious. And therefore, as we can stand on the edge of the cliff and watch Satan fall at his demise and realize that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing in this life that can really take us away from God. And yet, what happens? As Satan's fallen, he doesn't have that dollar store super soaker. He's crafty. He's got that, that big, the big one. You know what I'm talking about, kids? And so he's squirting, and what happens is maybe some water hits you. And you're standing there watching him fall, and some water hits you, and you start to think, oh, I'm defeated. i got a sprinkle of water on me. What am I going to do? And we forget, No. He's falling to his demise. God has declared in the scripture that he is victorious, that it is finished. And so what we see today is we see Jesus kindly exposing the disciples' wrong thinking. And even though at Pentecost the Holy Spirit came and empowered each one of us, we have the, the power to believe, the power to love, the power to preach. We oftentimes are just like these disciples. I hate to admit it. One thing that's been discouraged about reading through the Gospels is you just see the disciples, right, Carl? You see the disciples, and, and it's just this, man, again, time and time and time again. It's been refreshing to read through the book of Acts in our CBR journal because we see disciples who are empowered to live on mission, who are being persecuted, who are out preaching the Gospel. The kingdom's advancing. And we look through the Gospels and we see the disciples just palm and face time and time again. But the truth is that even God's Holy Spirit-empowered people fall short to these same prides. 
And so that's why the title of the sermon is The Disciples' Instruction, or Deconstruction. He's going to deconstruct them. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would deconstruct us today. Because God gives grace to the humble. God gives grace to the humble. One thing that no one in this room can say with 100% authenticity is that they don't struggle with pride. Everyone struggles with pride in some way, shape, or form. So God's going to tear them down and build them up. So from the Scriptures, the first point is this. Jesus kindly exposes and deconstructs the pride of selfish expectations. In verses 30 through 32, again, Jesus for the second time in this great discipleship discourse announces to them that He's going to go to the cross. That He's going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill Him. And when they kill Him, He's raised. Three days later, in verse 32, it says, They did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask Him. Jesus kindly exposes and deconstructs the pride of selfish expectations. They were dealing with something that they really didn't understand. You guys remember why, uh, what the disciples and what the nation of Israel was hoping for in the coming Messiah? Someone who would come and help them be victorious over political persecution. For, for hundreds of years, the nation of Israel had been oppressed by secular kingdoms who had come down, who had desolated the temple, who had exposed their laws, who had made it hard for them to worship God. And so what they wanted more than anything was someone who would come in and rule as a mighty earthly king and come in and destroy the earthly rule of Rome and bring them back to their prominence so that they could rule as an earthly kingdom. And Jesus says, I'm going to go and die and be raised three days later. And their response, as, as, as us probably would be as well, was they still didn't understand. But the, first, but the second part of verse 32 says, they were afraid to ask Him. Jesus kindly exposes and deconstructs the pride of selfish expectations. They were questioning Jesus, yet they were unwilling to question Jesus. See, a lot of times we, when we think about the, the, the narrative of the Gospels, we think about Jesus walking with His disciples, and we think about the Pharisees and how they just didn't understand that God was with them. And they're like, man, they just didn't get it. And what we see right here was the disciples didn't get it either. They had Jesus Christ, the God-man, the Messiah, in the flesh. And yes, He's pronouncing something that's very difficult to understand. And maybe it was in fear of how Jesus rebuked Peter last chapter, where He, he, he gives this pronouncement, and Peter's like, no, nah, that's not going to happen. And He says, get behind me, Satan. And so maybe there was fear of like, I don't get rebuked by Jesus. <laughs> But the truth in Scripture is that they were still afraid to ask Him. So my question to us today is, personally, as a family, as a GCG, as a church, if God's given us His truth and He's given us Himself, and He, he, he doesn't declare anything off limits, okay? Okay? He says, come to me. That's the only requirement. Come to him. Come to him. He doesn't say, hey, come to me if you've got it all figured out. Come to me if you have complete understanding of Scripture. Come to me if you can recite the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Come to me if you've done your CBR journal every single day. Come to me if you've attended every GCG. Come to me if you shared the gospel perfectly with every coworker. Come to me if you've loved your family as you know you should. Come to me if you've done everything correctly. Come to me, so on and so forth. He just says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. There's all kinds of other religions where God is an off-putting God who is separate. He's so holy and transcendent that He has no time for the people that worship Him. It's a fake God, by the way. But the true God of Scripture is in their presence. 
And if we are the people of God, He is also in our presence. And so how many times do you find yourself in the midst of a situation where you don't understand, afraid to ask Him? I know this is about His life, death, and resurrection, but applicably, this is hard stuff to swallow. We've got people in our church dealing with loved ones who are dying of cancer. We've got brothers and sisters in our church who have lost their wives and and there's, they've experienced some hard moments. And the truth is, nothing is promised for us. None of us would paint a picture of, I hope my brother gets cancer. She kind of would have never asked that. She would have never asked that of her brother. God's ways are sometimes hard for us to swallow. And so again, the question is, when God lays out for you something that's hard to understand, are you going to everyone else? Are you going to Google? Are you going to God? Are you going to Google or are you going to God? Jesus kindly exposes that. We read on in verse 33 through 37. They came to Capernaum. And he was in the house. He asked them, what were you discussing on the way? Remember, this is the omniscient Jesus who knows everything. Just like the omniscient God in the garden who says, where are you? God knew what they did. God knew that they sinned. And he, he's asking the question to prompt a response. And so in the scripture, he asked them, what were you discussing? Not because he didn't know, but because he wanted to let them know that he knew they were discussing something. Quite the opposite. Verse 34, they kept silent for on the way they had argued. So they went from not understanding the resurrection. They went from seeing the transfiguration, the glory of God revealed, coming and seeing a, a, a convulsing boy possessed by a demon be healed. Jesus talks about the resurrection. And what's the next, what's the next logical thing? The glory of God, these healings. What's, what's the next logical pro pro progression for a disciple? I'd like to think it's worship. Because if the glory of God happened, I don't think any one of us, if it happened right here in this room, the transfiguration, we'd all be on our faces. And so I don't know how many days passed from the transfiguration to this, but here's what they're arguing about. They're, they're trying to figure out who among them was the greatest? Who among them was the greatest? Can you imagine? I mean, I, I don't know, man. That just sounds extremely arrogant. Again, palm and face. Glorious God transfigured. Nothing has ever been seen like this in the history of mankind. The, the full glory of God revealed. The God who feeds the 5,000. The God who heals the demoniac. The God who... Uh, makes lame men walk, blind men see. And they're over here like, hey man, which one of us is the greatest? It seems like palm and face, right? So Jesus corrects them and he teaches them. He's good. This is what he says. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them and taking them in his arms. Where's Finn? Let me, let me, come here real quick, man. Let me, let me put you in my arms. Uh, how much do you weigh? I don't know. How much does he weigh? Somewhere around yes, 70 man. pounds. 60? 70. Picked up Moses. <laughs> Jesus has the child in his arms. They're over here arguing about who's the greatest. And he picks up this child. Maybe I should have picked up Isabel. She's a lot lighter. <laughs> he picks up this child and he shows them. If you're going to be great, you're going to serve them all. The Pharisees were really good about serving the prominent, important people. The guest of honor always had the, the greatest seat. Come eat. Come, come eat this great meal that we've prepared. Come look at us. 
Look how great we are. And the disciples, man, that's, that's really what they knew. They knew religiosity. So as they start walking with Jesus and these great things start happening, they start saying, well, who's going to be the greatest of us? Like there's Jesus, then I want to be next, and then you and you and you. There's a pecking order. And Jesus grabs the child and says, this is what greatness looks like. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Now, no offense to Finn. Maybe I should have grabbed one of the smaller ones that was further away. Lucas raised his hand. Audrey, she raised her hand too. So if, if we, if, if I serve Carl, if, if I go in and I, and, I, and I can win Carl over with lofty theological positions and Brother, look at the ministry and look at all the things our church is doing. He might be impressed. But as I go to Audrey, who has Angelman syndrome, right? She's cognitively, she's not processing things the way we do. Fair, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. But if I go to her, she don't care about none of that. What does she care about? You coming up and hugging her and loving her and, and holding her. And being there with her and talking with her. And Jesus says, if anyone wants to be first, he's got to do that. Our culture is, for better or for worse, you can use technology and social media to the glory of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. We're trying to do that. We're telling stories. We want people to know that there's a God who saves. There's a God who forgives. And there's a fine line between Hey, we're going out and, and, and feeding and helping and, and loving and discipling and so on and so forth versus look at us. I want to be seen. There's a very fine line. Jesus says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives Jesus receives the Father. You get the full benefits of the family the servanthood, and the Holy Spirit. Nothing's off limits. God's offering it to us freely for all of us who are trusting in Him. So again, my question is this. I didn't even get my point yet. Sorry. Jesus kindly exposes and deconstructs the pride of selfish ranking. We all do this. Whether you're cognizant of it or not, we all do this. An easy way to, uh, for God to expose this is go and um, go and do some homeless neighboring type ministry. And what will happen is internally you'll start to say us and them and, and we and them and those people. You may not use those words, but but man, that's kind of what happens. And I want to be, I want to be sensitive to if we have any friends in here who, who don't have a home. We love you. And we want to be here for you. But I'm telling you, man, the status of someone who has a home versus someone who does not starts to put us in different categories. And internally, we start to rank each other. That's an easy one. A more subtle one is how people will start to elevate the pastor of a church versus the people. I think in, in God's grace and kindness, I'm not the greatest speaker. I don't have it all figured out. So God's hopefully humbled us to a point where y'all are saying, well, we're not going to elevate him but or Jade, but we're all we're all on equal footing. And so what, what could happen in some churches is that people start, oh he's the pastor. I, I take my prayers to him. I can't talk to the people over here. I'm going to take them to the pastor. Or I'm, I'm, when this guy's around, or, or maybe it's a husband and wife situation. Uh, if, if, if we, you know, if you go to your house, there's a house of disorder and chaos, and then someone comes over, uh, maybe the pastor or whoever you want to clean up to make things look good. Because what you're really saying is, I don't really care about how I am normally, but I want people to be perceiving me as better than I actually am. I want to have a higher ranking.
We got a lot of kids in this church. So, some of you guys, me, uh, we don't like it when our kids act up in public. Why? What's the main reason? Because it makes us look bad. You know? And so what happens is we correct them, not because we love them and want to teach them. That might be, you know, an ulterior fruit of that. But in the moment, you're making me look bad. And I don't want to look bad. I don't want my, my notch to go down. I want to have a selfish and higher ranking than other people. And so the question is for you, where do you rank yourself? Do you rank yourself as equal with your brothers and sisters? Are you jockeying for position? Do you love some people in a specific way and other people you're, you're withholding because they might not be able to give you a prominent position? There's a lot of implications from this. There's a lot. The disciples were no different. Neither are we. But Jesus kindly exposes and deconstructs the pride of selfish ranking. Third point is this. Jesus kindly exposes and deconstructs the pride of selfish superiority. Similar to the last point. But it's just this idea that we're better than. Not necessarily that I need to be better than you, or, but just in general, I'm better than fill in the blank. Verse 36, Jesus took the child, said whoever receives him in my name. I was supposed to pick up Finn right there. It's in my notes. I picked up Finn too early. Got excited. I was waiting for it. That's what I was going to pick up Finn. He deconstructs the pride of selfish superiority. Very similar to the last point in this. And the question is, who do you think you're better than? Who do you think you're better than? Do you think that you're better than people who don't know Jesus? Do you hate hanging out with people who don't know Christ? Is it hard for you? It is for me. Because I'm like, what are we going to talk about? Time is short. I don't want to talk about the weather, sports. Man, it's just, how you doing? How's people's health? And so what happens is I start to take this, this place of superiority. And, and, and hear me out. Listen. If you are in Christ, you are much better off. Because you have an eternal hope that they don't have. But you're not better than them. Because of sin, the way it ravaged the earth, we're all on equal footing. We're all sinners. There's no one in this church who can claim to be sinless, perfect. If you think that, we, we can raise your hand and we'll, we'll figure out real quick. We don't teach that here. We don't believe that. And so what happens is when we see ourselves as sinners who have been justified simultaneously righteous it puts us on equal footing with those who don't know Jesus and if we're going to be the kind of church who gets together for GCGs and we invite people in and we go out to our community we meet publicly to do uh, DNA man let it not be said of any one of us that we walk around with an air of superiority with our noses in the air that somehow we're better than everybody else in the places we're going because the Lord has saved us. That's what was happening in the Scriptures. And Jesus proves the point by picking up a child and saying, no man, you serve this guy. We're all equal. We're better off, but we're not better. Jesus deconstructs the pride of selfish superiority. The fourth point is this. Jesus kindly exposes and deconstructs the pride of selfish branding. Verses 38 through 41, we see that they were, um, I'll just read it. Verse 38, 
John said to them, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. So, John details and out demons in Jesus' name who was not part of their group. Jesus being a kind, loving friend, teacher, God. He rebukes them. Verse 39. He said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. Verse 41, For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. This one right here hit really hard to me. Because I love our church. Uh, we just got pins made if you don't have one. They got the Convergence logo on there. There's a highlighter on the back so you can do your journals. I love our church, man. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget the history of it, how it arrived, how we meet in the Stanfords, us getting together, thinking there was there was more to church than just what we had seen. And we, we wanted to have intentional life on life, life in community, life on mission, relationships where we were pouring into each other, where we knew the ins and out of each other, that we, we love each other as family. We, we were just people who were kind of acquaintances on Sunday. We wanted to actually do mission together. We wanted to tell others about Jesus. We wanted to create an environment where people could come in and feel welcome and loved in a way that was different than what we saw. And by God's grace, it's happening. Uh, next month, we're going to be celebrating our two-year anniversary. We're moving into our third year. And man, I'm telling you, man, I love, I love you guys. And there's like five or families sick today. I love them too. But I love, I love you guys because what's happened is we had a vision that that was the Bible. It wasn't something that we just came up with out of nowhere. We looked at the scriptures and saw people who really loved each other, did life together, and we're on mission together. And then along the way, some of you guys said, Yeah, man, we, we like that as well. And so you kept coming and kept coming back. And we started meeting in our house. And we, it used to be called Christ Family Fellowship. We had this really funky looking, almost daycare logo that everyone hated but me. And we started printing out little uh, monthly, or, you know, uh, what are they called? We don't use those things anymore. Bulletin. Bulletin. We, had, we used to have bulletins. Y'all probably like, we need bulletins again. That was tough work. But we had bulletins. We, we, then we changed the name to Convergence because where we lived, it made sense. We called, we called our area Convergence. And then um, more people started coming. We, we covenanted together. We had a membership. Uh, we had a formal name. We became a 501c3. Uh, we came up with bylaws, constitution. We got a website. That's a big deal. Uh, we started meeting in a park. We started meeting in another church building. Then God called us down to Noda. And other people started coming from across the city. It wasn't just people in North Charlotte. We got people in South End, people uh, in, in West Charlotte. We got people from all over the city are coming now. We got t-shirts printed. And there's a logo that says Convergence. If you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a wonderful logo. Our Instagram is, is lit. Thanks to Bethany and Rebecca. Like, our name's getting out there. I, I, mean, with, I, I met with a pastor two weeks ago, and he said, man, y'all's church is known as the church that's really living on mission. And that was a high compliment, because he, he was a pretty established guy, and he was, he was just really encouraged about what's going on in our church. And so I say all that to say, that logo is pointless. Our brand is pointless. Now what does that mean? We throw the, we crack the pins, we throw them away, we burn our conversion shirts, we, we read that. No, no, no. In a hundred years, no one will know the name of convergence. We may blossom into a thriving missional community, sending church and blah, 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 so on and so forth. We may dissolve we may merge with another church, but in a hundred years, people will not know our name. They won't know my name. 
I hope this doesn't crush anyone's dreams, but they're probably not going to remember your name. A little bummed out up here. Awesome. But they will remember the name of Christ. They will remember the church of Christ that God said in Matthew 18 that would stand the test of time, that would not fail, that would always be successful. That's the church they'll remember. The church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Not the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but the church of Jesus Christ. Here's the problem. We're made in His image. We're made in His logo. And what we do and what's happened since the garden is we want to have our own logo. I remember when we started the church, Jay didn't even want to have a logo, a church name, none of that stuff. I'm like, how, like, how, are, like, how are people going to get? Like, what? I don't know. Like, where are they going to meet? Where are we going to send them to? And I'm not opposed to the name Convergence Church. I'm not opposed to any of that stuff. But listen, we are not living for Convergence Church. We are living for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not living for our GCGs, our model of missional communities, or even the mission of Jesus Christ. We studied last week in the soul care, the Brad Watson thing. We need to be centered around the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if we're centered around mission, if we're centered around a church name, if we're centered around a philosophy or a model, that stuff doesn't bear any eternal fruit. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can bear the kind of fruit that's needed for this kind of mission. So Jesus rebukes them, says, listen, what are you thinking? And I'm going to tell you something real quick. I'm sweating up here. Man, I don't even know how to say this the right way, so I'm just going to say it. I love our church. I love you guys. I love what you're doing in your missional communities. I love the fruit that's coming forth. And so sometimes I get around other church pastors, and I find myself in a place of superiority. Like, man, y'all don't get it. Y'all aren't doing it right. When are you going to wake up? That's wrong. It's no different than what they were doing. I liken the church of Jesus Christ to a Navy fleet. Maybe we said this before. In the fleet you have carriers. I'm going to educate you guys on, on Navy. Carriers can hold three to 5,000 people. Planes can land to come in. They can do all kinds of supplies. They have all kinds of uh, auxiliary support for the fleet. Uh, you have uh, cruisers, which are smaller, maybe a thousand folks. They have helos. They have uh, anti-air, anti-sub type warfare capabilities. And then you have the destroyer, which I was on, which is the best type of ship in the fleet. And they hold about 300 people. And they can do anti-air, anti anti-surface, anti-subsurface. And so the, the, the destroyer can go places the carrier can. And then even smaller than that, you have rib boats that contain... Guys like the SEALs. And they can go into really, really hard places and do very detailed, intricate missions. More dangerous type stuff. And so what can happen is the SEALs can somehow think that they're better than the rest of the fleet. Because we're the ones out here shooting our guns all the time. We're the ones out here with face paint, crawling through the mud, destroying, sniping the enemies. Right? Well, guess what? Those SEALs don't have fuel for their boat apart from the tankers. Those seals don't have face paint apply, apart from the supply ships. Those seals don't have a boat to, to, to ride in on apart from uh, the naval fleet, the shipbuilders. Everything's working together. And so please, hear me on this point. Yes, love our church. Yes, love the people in your GCGs. Yes, love your DNA. Yes, love Convergence Church. Don't hate other churches. Don't hate other philosophies of ministry. Don't hate other Christian pastors who are preaching the gospel at churches who are bigger than us or smaller than us or do things different than us. Amen? Can we all agree on that? And then please, remind and correct me if you hear me saying anything contrary to what I just said. Because I, I struggle with this. 
Jesus is kind to deconstruct the pride of our selfish bravery. Where does it all lead us? Fifth point. The selfish pride results in the ultimate deconstruction. These are the warnings from Christ. Verse 42, Jesus says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to fall away would be better to have a heavy millstone thrown around his neck. Now, um, the term little ones here is not specifically talking about little children, but he's talking about disciples. In, in the context of what we just read, he's more talking about the people that they just said, they're not from our logo. And so Jesus was rebuking them saying, no, 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 don't cause them to stumble. He's talking about the church. I got a picture of a millstone. If you don't know what a millstone is, that's a millstone. Does anyone know how much a millstone weighs? Huh? A ton. That sounds right. I don't even know. Uh, I was going to put another picture. I found one online where a guy has a millstone around his neck. It's a cartoon. And he's, and he's fallen to the bottom of the ocean floor. And I thought, man, that might be a little graphic, even though I just detailed it. But the point is here is Jesus saying, listen, if you're going to cause other disciples to stumble and fall away from the faith, you might as well put a one-ton millstone around your neck and throw yourself in the deepest part of the ocean because I don't want you I don't want you in this kingdom the mob used to give people cement shoes y'all know what that is? Yes. man that's gruesome they fill up a tub full of concrete put their enemies in it let it fill up and they throw them off the boat into the middle of the deepest part of the rivers there's no coming back from that and so this is a stern warning from Jesus to His church, to His bride. He's saying, do not do these th things to the church. Don't prohibit people from coming to Christ. If you're out in public and someone uh, who's not a Christian is, is, is being drawn to the light and asking questions about your church, asking about our church or, or Jesus or the Gospel, don't be the kind of person who's like... Man, they, they, that guy cussed in our meeting. Like, I don't want him with us. Don't be that guy. If your brother and sister in the church is struggling, don't be that guy who is coming against them, talking about them behind their back. Jesus says, if you cause them to stumble, I'd rather see you at the bottom of the ocean with a millstone around your neck. This is tough language. This is a sharp rebuke. It's a good rebuke, though. We need it. Verse 43 says, If your hand causes you to fall away, cut it off. It's better to enter into life maimed than enter to hell with two hands. Now again, this is figurative. Okay? So I don't want anyone who <clears throat> may have done something sinful with their hand chopping their hand off. It's not what he's saying. Because Jesus isn't concerned with the outward. He's concerned with the inward. You can chop your hand, hand off for stealing and still be a thief. You hear me? So verse 43, I think he's talking about our actions. Verse 43. So he's saying, listen, whatever causes you to stumble or make others stumble, the things that you do with your hands, cut it off. Everybody got one of these? This thing right here, I don't even know what kind of sermon Jesus would preach if these things were in existence. He might do an entire book. If, like if Jesus spoke about stuff, we might just throw them out the window, man. Because these things can really cause us to stumble and cause others to stumble. So whatever you do with your hands, the things that you do, cut them off. Skip into verse 47. He says, if your eye causes you to fall away, cut it off. Better to enter life maimed than enter hell with two eyes. Sam Storm says, Very little sin, if any, comes out of your heart that did not first enter through your eyes. Very little sin, if any, comes out of your heart that did not first enter through your eyes. Going back to these things. This thing is, is it takes our hands to operate, and it, and, it, and it comes in through your eyes, the windows of your soul, the windows of your heart, and it impacts us in ways, and damages us in ways that can be Long-term devastating. If you struggle with pornography, come talk to me. Any one of y'all. 
male or female. This is something that's ravaging the church. It's so easily accessible. You can find pornography on accident. Parents, if, if, I'm sorry if this is sensitive. You need to talk to your kids about this. Because the things that people see on YouTube, just a simple Google search, can destroy your children. A good friend of mine, <clears throat> Timothy Brindle, some of y'all know him. Um, he's publicly confessed. Uh, he was, I think he's the greatest Christian hip-hop artist ever. Uh, he's actually coming to preach to our church uh, in October. You guys can be the judge of that. He's going to perform at the Fall Festival. But he put out his first album, The Great Awakening. The second album was Killing Sin. And then he took eight years off. Why? Because he struggled with pornography to the point where it almost cost him his marriage, his ministry. And you know what that brother has? You know what kind of phone he has now? A flip phone. Do they even make those? Hey. We have one. He's got one. We have one. So a flip phone is a phone that flips open. You've never seen one. <laughs> and he's got that because he knew that he could not handle. The temptation was so strong that it would cause him to stumble. He couldn't handle it. And so my wisest, most gentle way I can say this. If you're struggling with the sin of pornography, you might need a new phone. Because it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with a flip phone than enter to hell with the latest iPhone. Amen. And that may sound stern, but man, I'm saying that out of love. Because these images can destroy us. And I, and I, I didn't even realize it's a, it's a problem for females too. So I want to be sensitive. If you need counseling on that, if you need accountability on that, I'd love to help you with that. But I can say it no more simply than Cut it off. Cut it off at the root. So he talks about the things we do. He talks about the things we see. And then in verse 45, he says, if your foot calls you to fall away, cut it off. And I believe he's talking about two things. It can be interpreted two ways. The way we walk is often interpreted as our character. But the way we walk takes us to places. So it could be geographical. So if you go to places where you know you're going to be sinning or causing others to stumble in sin, don't go there. You know what one of the greatest stumbling blocks about Donald Trump is? I'm not trying to be political. I'll get in trouble for this. But it's his character. If you look at the legislation and things he's passed, most of it's been pretty good. Most of it's been pretty good. But man, this guy just doesn't know how to stay off Twitter and, and berate people online. Like his character's flaw. The, the things they brought up in his campaign was the things he said that was defamatory against women. So most people, when they attack Donald Trump, it's not because of the things he's done. It's because of his character. So our character is, is, can make people stumble. You can be the nicest, uh, you know, Christian guy who goes lives on mission, who helps feed people and teach people the Scripture, but in your interpersonal relationships, you're just a jerk. Your character is just off. Don't be a jerk. Cut it off. Sometimes I'm a jerk, man. My kids think that's a bad word because like, that's not a good word, but it's, it's, it's not. And sometimes I'm that way. And I need help and accountability this way as well. And Jesus says if we leave these things unchecked, there's a place for us called hell. Guyana. Jesus preached more on hell than anyone else in the entire scripture. A lot of Christians want to shy away from hell because hell means judgment. Hell means repent. Hell means turn from who you are and turn towards Jesus. Hell ensues that you're doing something wrong that deserves penalty. And Jesus is warning us against it. So Christians, don't shy away from talking about hell. People need to know that for all those who are unrepentant, there's a place called hell. And that's where they're headed. Verse 49 says, says this, For everyone will be salted with fire. There's two meanings here. The first is for non-repentant people. Sinners will be consumed to an inexhaustible torment in hell. So this is our motivation. This is the ultimate deconstruction. This is the deconstruction that never ends. Hell is not a place where 
you go and you get broken down to a place and then it stops and everything's kind of cooled off for a minute. There's no relief. It's constant torment, never ending. You get that? Oh, but the grace of God. The grace of God. Our sixth point is this. God's unselfish grace results in the ultimate reconstruction. Again, verse 49. For all those who have been born again, for all those who have the imperishable seed, the guarantee, the seal of the Holy Spirit, we will never get to experience the inexhaustible flames of hell. Praise God. Amen. What do we experience? The unlavished merit, the favor, the grace, the refreshment, the constant renewal, the never-ending love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It's all yours, Christian, if you've trusted in Christ. However, verse 49 also applies to us. Again, I'll read it again. Verse 49. Everyone will be salted with fire. Christian, do you know that your life will be filled continually with trials? The Bible talks about our trials being a refining fire. These are the things that make us. The refining fire was meant to purify the object of its intention. And so the refining fire isn't just something that's put in your life to cause pain. It's meant to the pain is meant to be a megaphone of grace so that you know where you can go, where you can turn to. Verse 50 says salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, where will it season? Where will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. I'm running over time, but I'm going to explain this verse really simply. To, meet, to make meat savory and keep flesh from corrupting, so is the grace of God to season men's hearts, to make their discourse savory and preserve them from the corruption of sin so that men made partakers of the grace of God, so that they are good and useful to others, both by the words and actions, and especially be ministers of the gospel who are the salt of the earth. But what if salt lost its saltiness? There is no recovering from it. There's no good that comes from a, a saltless piece of meat. It will decay and it will rot away. So Jesus tells us to have salt in ourselves. This is the doctrine of grace and the word of Christ. To have prudence and talk and conversation and holiness in your heart and life as to behave wisely towards others who are without it. No superiority. And finally, to have peace with one another. With God... He calls us into peace. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And we've called to be reconcilers, to be ambassadors on behalf of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5. We go as people who have been reconciled into a lost world who is waiting to be reconciled. We have peace with Christ and peace with each other. And our goal is to have peace with others. And the only way that can be accomplished is by preaching the good news. So how do we as Christians maintain and sustain this Christian life? How do we keep our salt? How do we keep that grace-filled life? We must abide in Jesus Christ. That's it. John 15. Abide in me and I in you. You'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The simple answer, if we're going to be reconstructed into the fullness of Christ individually and corporately, we have to abide in Jesus. We can do that because of Jesus. Philippians 2, he says this, Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God to be a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God 
having this mind. Having this mind. Fellow brothers and sisters, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. All your anxieties on Him, cast them there because He cares for you. The Christian life is filled with being deconstructed, of our flesh being torn down, and being built up in the grace of God. So the reflection questions are this. I don't want you guys to hear this and not do anything with it. Number one, what area of selfishness and pride is God exposing in your own life? What area of selfishness or pride is God exposing in your own life? If you don't think you have any, please come talk to me. Please come talk to me. Number two, will you confess to God your sin and ask for forgiveness? The beauty of our God is says He forgives all sin. But you have to humbly come to Him. And the third question, which person will you tell about this and ask to hold you accountable? If you know you struggle with pride and you ask God for forgiveness... God has given us the church, your fellow brothers and sisters, to hold you accountable. Maybe you have selfish expectations, a selfing ranking structure where you put yourself superior to others, or you branded yourself as better or having the way figured out greater than others. Will you humble yourself, brothers and sisters? Will you hold each other accountable so that we might be humbled that we receive the grace of God? Lord, thank you so much for your word. God, I know it's convicting, but it's so good. We thank you, Lord, that you haven't left us as people trying to figure things out on our own, but you've given us your scripture and you've given us your spirit. So Holy Spirit, I pray you would take what was said today, that you would illuminate the truth to our hearts. You would help us, empower us to obey what you're calling us to do, God. We know that you're continually refining us. We know that it's not always easy. But God, we know there's refreshment and comfort and encouragement in you. We thank you that we will, as your people, never be cast into the lake of fire because of our Lord Jesus. And so I pray, Father, that you would draw our lost brothers and sisters today to our Lord Jesus that they might escape the flames of hell. We love you, Lord. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to move into the Lord's Supper. Um, the reflection questions, hopefully you, you 